This video discusses types of chemical bonding. So there are three types of chemical bonds that chemists like to talk about. First being metallic. So metallic bonds of course occur between metals and we can describe metallic bonding using the electron C model that we've already talked about. So in this model we imagine that the metal atoms do not have a very tight hold on their valence electrons. That's consistent with their really low electronegativity. So when they get together, together to bond, what they're going to do is just kind of give up their valence electron. Just kind of throw them out there and says, hey, anybody that wants to kind of feel this charge, go ahead, doesn't bother me, whatever. And so we get this picture. So we imagine that the metal atom gives up its valence electron and is left with a positively charged core. And then the valence electron is pretty much free to move around wherever it wants to. So the force that holds this whole mess together is the electrostatic, electrostatic attractive force between these positively charged islands and the negatively charged electron C that acts like a glue that holds these atoms together. So that's the electron C model. So there's some important things to notice about this model. First off, that this can only happen between atoms with low electronegativity. So you need atoms that are willing to let go and release their electrons fairly easily in order to do this. Also, these bonding electrons are what we call delocalized. So the electrons that are the glue that holds this mess together, the bonding electrons, they don't have to be in any particular location. They are free to move around wherever they want, any particular orientation. So we say that they are delocalized. Second, the bonding force doesn't have any particular direction. So what I mean by bonding force, that's the force of attraction between the atoms. So the force of attraction between the atoms, well really an atom is attracted to the electron C that's all around it. So really the direction is all directions equally. So that's the force of attraction. It doesn't have to be directed on the line between two atoms that might be bonded. So it's sort of in all directions. The next type of chemical bond is a covalent bond. And covalent bonds are typically described in chemistry using Lewis's dot structure model that shows shared electron pairs. So I've underlined shared here because that's an important idea. Covalent bonds involve the sharing of electrons between atoms so as to complete the valence shell on those atoms that are bonded together. And here's a typical picture of a Lewis dot structure for water showing electrons as dots. And we imagine that this represents the buildup of electron density between these two atoms hydrogen and oxygen and it's that buildup of electron density that acts like a glue that holds the positively charged cores of the atoms together. So this would be the Lewis dot model. So a couple things about the Lewis about covalent bonds is that they tend to form between atoms with high electronegativity. So these are atoms that do not want to release, let go of their electrons. So since they don't want to let go, they're going to hold on to them, but they're going to grab a hold of some other electrons too that are nearby. And so there's like this tug of war going on between the electrons. So both atoms that are bonded together are trying to hold tightly to their valence electrons because they both have relatively high electronegativities. And it will then be the electronegativity difference between the two atoms that determines in this tug of war for the shared electrons who gets the lion's share of the electron density. And so when an atom pulls more electron density to itself, it builds up a larger partial negative charge. And that polarizes the bond so that one end is negative and one end is positive so that there's more electron density one place than another. So another thing about this model that's different than the metallic bonding model is that now electron density is localized between the bonding atoms. So we imagine that these electrons aren't free to just kind of wander out in this direction somewhere. They have to kind of stay tightly in this region between the oxygen and the hydrogen. Furthermore, the bonding force is directed. So there's a strong force of attraction along the line connecting these two atoms. So that's where the bonding force is directed. So this is directional bonding. So it has a particular direction where the two forces are pulling these atoms together towards the glue, the shared electron pair in the middle. Um, also, it turns out that covalent bonds are stronger. That means they have a higher bond energy. More energy is required to break the bond than metallic bonds, at least on average. Now, there's some special cases where you can find metallic bonds that are particularly strong or covalent bonds that are particularly weak. But on average, that's true. And our last type of chemical bonding are ionic bonds. 
Ionic bonds involve the complete transfer of electrons from one atom to another atom to form ions. And in some cases, we can transfer those electrons to a molecular structure to form polyatomic ions. Then these ions will be held together mostly by the electrostatic force. Now in truth, there is some electron sharing going on here. So it looks a little bit like a covalent bond. But mostly, we can ascribe the bonding force to the electrostatic force. That's the Coulombic force between the oppositely charged ions. And so here's a picture showing the formation of sodium chloride. So sodium would normally have three shells in our shell model with one electron in the n equal 3 shell. But we imagine that that electron has been pulled away and given to the chlorine to complete its outer shell. So now both of these atoms have complete outer shells. They look like noble gases. But the sodium has picked up a positive charge because it has lost an electron. And this extra electron, the little blue guy right here, that has gone into chlorine's valence shell, has added one extra negative charge to chlorine, making it minus 1. And then it's the attraction between plus and minus, the old plus likes minus deal, that causes the Coulombic attraction between these guys. So a couple of comments about ionic bonds. So they happen between atoms with very different electronegativities. So sodium doesn't hold very tightly to its valence electron, whereas chlorine will hold very tightly to any electron that is in its valence shell. So it's grabbing those electrons. So an electron in the valence shell of chlorine will be stabilized relative to the valence shell of sodium, which is why it tends to move there. And so we need to have a big difference in electronegativities to facilitate that. Again, electrons are now localized on the ions. So unlike the electron C model, where these electrons, the valence electrons, are free to wander wherever they want, this electron has gone boom, here. And so it's going to stay next to the chlorine. The chlorine doesn't want to let it go. Furthermore, the bonding force is going to be directed along the lines between oppositely charged ions. So between the sodium and the chlorine, chlorine, this line right here between them, that's where the force is going to be pulling the hardest. So in a uh, ionic compound, we form a crystal lattice. So next to the sodium cation, I will surround it with chloride ions, negatively charged chloride ions. And the sodium is going to feel an attraction, a force of attraction, to each of those chloride ions. But again, this is going to be a directed bond. So the force is directed in particular directions, not just everywhere like we saw in the electron C model. And finally, these bonds are stronger on average than covalent bonds. Of course, there's some overlap. But on average, ionic bonds are the strongest type of chemical bonds. So now we need to talk about in-between bonding. So it turns out that these three bond types that I've just described really represent extremes. And most chemical compounds exhibit bonding that's kind of in between these three extreme areas. So we can talk about what those extremes are by looking at electronegativity. So if we look at a simple way at electronegativity difference, then we can see that we move slowly between from pure covalent, where there's no electronegativity difference, to polar covalent, where there is some charge distribution, to if you have a really big electronegativity difference, you might form an ionic compound. So that's illustrated a little bit here in these electrostatic potential maps for these three substances, lithium hydride, hydrogen, H2, and hydrogen fluoride, HF. So an electrostatic potential map, um, what we do is we draw a surface around each of these molecules so that we enclose like 99% of the electron density. So there's a 99% chance that the electron will be found on or inside the surface that we've drawn. So in that sense, these give you a kind of an idea of what these different molecules might look like, you know, if you could actually touch one or hold one in your hand. Then what we're going to do is we're going to paint on that surface colors corresponding to the uh, force that a charged particle would feel. So if we pick a positively charged particle and we put it on the surface in a particular area, we're going to paint it red if it feels a strong attractive force. And then we're going to go through green and finally to blue and purple if it feels a strong repulsive force. So that means that the purple areas are the most electrostatically positive. The red areas are the most electrostatically negative. So down here, I've listed two features, the difference in electronegativity and the average electronegativity between the two atoms that are bonded. And these electronegativities are taken from the Allen electronegativity scale rather than the Pauling electronegativity scale. So we see that for hydrogen, the H2 molecule, it's pretty much green everywhere. That means there's not much attractive or repulsive force if you were to put a charged particle on this surface somewhere. 
Um, the difference in electronegativity between the two hydrogen atoms is zero because they both have the same electronegativity. Um, hydrogen's electronegativity is 2.30 on the Allen scale. So if we average that between the two atoms, 2.30 plus 2.30 divided by 2, we get 2.30 as the average electronegativity. Now if we look at difference in electronegativity, and we look at these two uh, pictures for LiH and HF, in this picture it looks like we've stripped a lot of electron density away from the lithium. This in fact looks a lot like an ionic compound. We've got a positively charged cation here next to a negatively charged anion. But you see that the in between, that the uh, electrostatic potential changes smoothly. That might be indicative of some actual sharing going on here between the lithium and the hydride. And we see that the difference in electronegativity is 1.39. Now over here in HF, we see that the electronegativity difference is 1.89. So this is a very polar molecule, and we can tell that. But we also see that the electron density is much more evenly distributed. So we don't have this little nose bump that's sticking out on LiH here for the hydrogen. So why might that be? Why is the electron density more smoothly distributed here that might be consistent with having a very polar covalent bond, rather than here where we might have something that looks more like an ionic bond? Well, the reason has to do with the average electronegativity. So the average electronegativity between H and F is pretty high. Um, H, hydrogen's electronegativity is 2.30. Fluorine's electronegativity is 4.19. So when you average those, we get a pretty big difference. So that means that both of these atoms want to really hold on fairly tightly to their electrons. So this hydrogen is pretty unwilling to give away electron density even though uh, the fluorine is pulling really hard on it. So there's this smoother transition as we move from hydrogen to fluorine over here. Whereas over here, our average electronegativity is much lower between lithium and hydrogen. So that means that the lithium and the hydrogen don't pull as tightly on their electrons. So lithium is much more willing to give up its electron to hydrogen, because neither one has a tight hold. And hydrogen has a much tighter hold than lithium, which is why we get this shape. So the point of all this is to say that we can see that as we change these values, difference in electronegativity and average electronegativity, that we can see how molecules change from being pure covalent, as in H2, to something that's very polar covalent, like HF, to something that's approaching ionic, like LiH. So this lets us think about a bonding as three extremes. And the way to represent three different extremes rather than on a line is um, with a triangle. So this creates what we call the bond type triangle. So let me tell you about the bond type triangle and these two axes. So the y-axis right here is the difference in electronegativity. Delta means difference, so delta electronegativity. So you see that when we have big electronegativity differences between two bonded atoms, what side are we on? We're up here at the ionic bonding column, uh, corner. So as we move more and more towards this corner of the bond type triangle, um, bonding will appear more and more ionic in character. This corner of the uh, periodic table, um, of the bond type triangle, has a uh, really small electronegativity difference. So now we need to talk about the x-axis a little bit. So this is average, AVG, electronegativity. So if you have a small difference in electronegativity, but a big average electronegativity, that means you've got atoms that are holding on really tightly to their electrons. And if the electronegativity difference is small, then what are they going to have to do? They're going to have to share those electrons. They don't want to give them away, so they're going to have to share them. And that gives rise to covalent bonds. And then as we make the electronegativity larger and larger, we move up the bond type triangle and cross over into polar covalent. So this line right here that's drawn at about 1 for an electronegativity difference, that's kind of approximate, and it's based on um, you know, experimental data. But it's still kind of approximate where this crossover from covalent to polar covalent is. And really, it kind of moves smoothly from one to the other. But as you get to this corner, things appear more polar covalent. Then let's look at this corner of the uh, triangle. So this corner would be the covalent bonding corner. This corner over here, then, is the last one, metallic bonding. So metallic bonding, what we have are small differences in electronegativities because we're bonding metal atoms together. And their average electronegativity is also going to be low. So they're not going to hold on to their electrons very tightly. And so that's going to give rise to metallic bonding. We can use that electron C model. And then we would see that if we move 
um, the average electronegativity higher so that the atoms are holding on more and more tightly to their uh, electrons that we move over here into this covalent region. Now here's this little pink triangle down here that we haven't talked much about. And these would be what we call semi-metallic compounds. So these are metals or, or uh, semi-metallic compounds that are going to have properties in between covalent and metallic compounds. And this is actually a very important region because all semiconductor technology, which makes up of all modern electronics, they're based out of materials that are in this little tiny pink triangle. So if you are a scientist and trying to design uh, materials that might be good new semiconductors, you would want to look for things that would have um, average electronegativities and differences in electronegativities that put you somewhere in this triangle. So you need to be able to hold on to your electrons sort of tightly, but not too tightly, right? So if they're not held on, if they're held on really tightly, then you're covalent. You're not gonna, not gonna get those to move around. But if you hold on to them really loosely, then you've got an electrical conductor and they're gonna flow really well. So that's the bond type triangle. Here's an image of the bond type triangle from your book that um, gives you a little more detail about um, the different compounds and where they might fall. So up here at the top, again, this is pure ionic. This corner down here is the metallic corner. And this corner over here is the covalent corner. So you see that a molecule like O2, right? O2 has no difference in electronegativity, and its average electronegativity is pretty high. So here's O2, N2, Cl2. Right here would be F2 at this far corner. So it's sort of our prototypical most covalent, most pure covalent bond. Way up here, we've got cesium fluoride, so there's a huge difference in electronegativity. Since one has a really low electronegativity and one has a really big electronegativity, the average electronegativity is kind of in between down here. Over here, we've got uh, things like normal metals. So down here at the bottom, it lists the electronegativities for various atoms that you might be thinking about. So sodium, barium, lithium, they're all down here. So those are going to be metallic bonds. They've got a difference in electronegativity of zero. Then if you start making metallic compounds, so these are what we call intermetallic compounds. So there's one up here made between cadmium and lithium, that little black dot right there. And you see that it's kind of squarely still in the metallic region, but we're beginning to move towards the ionic region. Here's a compound involving barium and silicon, and we're getting even closer to the ionic region. Now this is interesting. Here's some compounds, calcium hydride and magnesium hydride, these two dots right here. They're on this little fuzzy line. So we might think of those as ionic compounds with calcium having a two plus and hydrogen having a minus, but we see that they're really close to being metallic bonded. So we might guess that those electrons are not held as, in as localized a way as we might think of in ionic compounds. So you can see that there are a lot of differences. Here's some ionic compounds, oxides of barium, calcium, and magnesium. But once we get to zinc, zinc oxide is kind of on the border between ionic and covalent. And then there are compounds like aluminum chloride, a metal and a nonmetal. We would probably guess that that's ionic. But our bond type triangle is telling us, well, it really has properties that are smack dab in between ionic and covalent. So there's a fair amount of electron sharing going on there. And that's going to have consequences for its properties. For example, those bonds are going to be fairly strong. Aluminum chloride might not be very soluble in water uh, for that reason. So um, some of those things help explain properties of molecules.